morning, everyone. Good to see you all. Thanks for coming. Welcome to uh, our beginning grand rounds, which are now going live again. Very excited about that. Welcome to everyone who's on Zoom and really encourage you, if you are on campus, to please um, come down to Hatch and, uh, and also we have breakfast for you. So uh, this is a beginning of our academic year. Really happy that uh, you know all of our residents. You know we had a good start to the year so far. That our residents, you know, increased to their next PGY year, and our new interns have continued to come back every day, which is terrific. <laughs> Along with our new program director, Dr. Majid. So welcome to him. He's been coming every day. He actually found Hatch today by himself without the chief residents. So that was an accomplishment for him. And um, so that's how we started the week. And then we ended the week with a dramatic fire in Annenberg and really wanted to have a shout out to Dr. Gore and Dr. Jeffrey and to Dr. Aqua and Dr. Phil Potts and all the staff at the Mickey who did an absolutely incredible job um, in hearing the stories from that, that day. So really thank them very much. And, and if you talk about christening by fire, our new minted chief resident, Dr. Matthew, managed the whole night um, up on the phone, including calling into the hospital and asking, can I speak to the fire marshal? To which he promptly would have responded, who are you asking for the fire marshal? So, uh, so we've had an exciting week and very excited to um, start off our grand round series. And with that, I'll invite Dr. Casasanta up to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Um, Jamie Hook is an assistant professor in the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine and a member of the Department of Microbiology's Global Health and Emerging Pathogens Institute. She completed medical school at the University of Wisconsin, internship at NYU, and residency and pulmonary critical care fellowship at Columbia University Medical Center. At Columbia, she carried out postdoctoral research training in two areas clinical epidemiology with David Lederer, and basic biology of acute lung injury with Dr. Jahar Bhattanchaira. Jamie moved to Mount Sinai in uh, 2019 to establish her own lab. Her R01 funded research program uses live lung imaging and mouse models to understand how viruses and bacteria cause lung injury and how injured lungs repair with the overall goal of developing new approaches to therapy for people with severe lung infections. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hook for Grand Rounds. All right. Well, thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here for the inaugural in-person Grand Rounds. Um, again, my name is Jamie Hook, and I'm uh, happy to share with you our recent progress related to uh, flu lung infection. And I have no disclosures. Flu lung infection is a major, uh, major cause of global mortality, and seasonal flu causes more than 20,000 deaths per year in the United States alone, and that number of deaths increases dramatically during years of flu pandemics. Since the flu pandemic risk is about 3% per year, we consider flu lung infection to be an issue of major global and public health significance. Now, interestingly, the highest rates of death occur in those flu-infected patients who develop a secondary lung infection by Staph aureus, but the reasons for that are not clear. Staph lung infection is thought to initiate when staph bacteria are inhaled from the nasal epithelium into the lung. And when bacteria are inhaled into the flu-infected lung, they encounter an environment that's been altered by flu in a way that becomes hospitable to bacterial lung infections. So for example, flu inhibits uh, neutrophil uptake and killing of bacteria, and flu alters airway mucociliary transport so that uh, bacteria are better able to adhere to the airway epithelium and survive in the flu-infected lung. So that's all important, but what about lung alveoli? Lung alveoli are important because they comprise, the alveolar epithelium comprises more than 95% of the uh, lung surface area. And in severe lung infections, it's the loss of alveolar barrier function that leads to leakage of fluid from microvessels into air spaces, causing alveolar edema, pulmonary edema, ARDS. And so uh, alveolar function is lung function, and alveolar function is very important to the pathophysiology of severe lung infections. Now, alveoli, because of their central role to lung function, are very good at defending themselves against bacterial infections. So they have a layer of surfactant, 
flow of alveolar wall liquid and phagocytosis by alveolar macrophages. And all of these mechanisms serve to prevent uh, uh, lung infections under normal conditions. So what happens in flu-infected lungs? So we asked the question, well, how does flu promote stabilization of inhaled staph and lung alveoli, leading to alveolar infection, alveolar damage, and lung injury? Now, that's a complex question. So we started with something a little more simple, which was how do inhaled staph stabilize in alveoli of healthy lungs? And to answer this question, we went to our live imaging approach. We start by growing a staph strain called USA 300, which is a clinically relevant strain of staph aureus. And then we intranasally instill mice with staph. We perform a surgery uh, whereby we place three cannulas, one in the trachea, one in the pulmonary artery, and one in the left atrium. We then uh, we remove the heart, lungs, and cannulas on block and arrange them under a confocal microscope objective. We attach the tracheal cannula to a ventilator that we use to inflate the lungs and the PA and LA cannulas to a pump that we use to perfuse the lungs with blood. So when we're finished, what we have in front of us is a live, intact, blood-perfused lung that we can use to view single alveoli or groups of alveoli. We also instill bacteria directly into lung alveoli by a technique called alveolar micropuncture. Um, and to do this, we use glass or micropipettes. Under microscopic guidance, we actually puncture a single alveolus and instill the bacteria directly into alveolar air spaces. So you'll recall that my question was, how do inhaled staph stabilize in alveoli of healthy lungs? And let me show you what we found. So this is a confocal image of live alveoli one hour after intranasal installation of staph. The alveolar epithelium is shown here in red, air spaces in black, and bacteria in green. And you can see here a few things. First, inhaled staph reach alveoli, and they associate with the alveolar wall. But these, uh, their location in alveoli is not random. We found that they, were, they tended to uh, be located here, where three alveolar septa come together. And where the septa come together forms a, a, a niche location or a little pocket or a corner um, in alveoli where the bacteria cluster. So we term these alveolar regions niches and the clusters of bacteria in them microaggregates. And I think you can better appreciate the microaggregates in these niche locations here in this high power image of a single alveolus. Again, the alveolar epithelium is shown in red, airspace in black, and the bacteria in green. We found that some of the microaggregates were fairly large. So I think you can you know, count the individual bacteria in this uh, microaggregate here. There's more than 30 bacteria just in this two-dimensional image of a single, uh, uh, of a single you know, alveolar slice. So um, we did a number of investigations uh, to understand the biology of these microaggregates and their contribution to lung infection. And I'll just share with you some of the highlights. So we found that microaggregates form rapidly within minutes of microinstallation into alveoli. And they only form in these protected niche locations. They do not form on flat surfaces of alveoli, and they do not form on glass slides in vitro. We also found that they stabilize in these, in these niches for hours. So they sit against the alveolar wall uh, for hours at a time. Um, and the stabilization of the bacteria was due to the bacterial interactions that resulted from a staph surface protein called PHND. So they don't actually stick to the alveolar epithelial surface. They stick to each other within this protected niche location. So staph secrete a number of toxins, uh, one of which is called alpha hemolysin. And alpha hemolysin forms pores in host cell membranes. And so we considered that if a microaggregate of staph is sitting against the alveolar wall for hours, secretion of toxin may lead to damage to the underlying alveolar epithelial membrane. We can use our imaging approach to determine whether damage has occurred in the following way. So we uh, instill the alveolar air spaces with a dye called calcine AM. And this acid oxymethyl ester moiety on the end allows for the dye to, be, to cross the alveolar epithelial membrane and be taken up by the cytosol. Once inside, that AM moiety is cleaved off by esterases, which traps calcine inside the cell. So as long as the alveolar epithelial membrane is intact, calcine fluorescence is steady. In the setting of me membrane damage, however, as in response to toxin, calcine leaks out of the cell, and we observe that as a loss of calcine fluorescence. So in this assay, loss of calcine fluorescence signals alveolar epithelial membrane damage. So that's the basis of the assay. Now let me show you what we found. So these are two example alveoli that have been calcine loaded. And you can see the calcine fluorescence here shown in red. Um, these two example alveoli have been instilled with two different strains of staph. So they're both USA 300, but on the bottom, we instilled the wild type USA 300. And on the top, 
a toxin null staph that genetically lacks the capability to generate alpha hemolysin toxin. So I'm going to show you two high power images of these alveolar septa that are associated with microaggregates. And you can see that the baseline calcium fluorescence is the same. There was no change in calcium fluorescence in response to the installation of toxin null staph, but there was a tremendous loss of calcium fluorescence uh, after installation of the wild type staph. So we interpret that installation of staph uh, wild type uh, causes formation of microaggregates, which leads to a toxin dependent alveolar epithelial damage. Now, I don't uh, want to spend a lot of time on this project. It was a big project, so I'm just going to summarize um, our findings in this cartoon. So we found that inhaled staph USA 300 rapidly form microaggregates in alveolar niches where they stick together through these PHND interactions. That leads to a secretion of the HLA toxin, which damages the underlying epithelial membrane, leading to an increase of calcium in the epithelial cytosol. That calcium transits across gap junctional channels to uninfected regions of alveoli, eventually leading to a widespread loss of alveolar barrier function and fatal pulmonary edema. And uh, we also found that these microaggregates, because they're stuck, you know, you saw how closely the bacteria are stuck together, that sticking actually inhibits penetration by antibiotic sized molecules and leads to antibiotic resistance. So this project was informative in that it helped us understand how inhaled staph stabilize an alveoli of healthy lungs. And I think it revealed the previously unrecognized role of the lung microanatomy, meaning alveolar niches, in the initiation of lung infection the evolution of alveolar damage, and the development of antibiotic resistance. So, uh, and I should also mention, we found we could block this process by inhibiting the PHND interactions or by inhibiting gap junctional channels. So now that we understand a little bit about how inhaled staph stabilize an alveoli of healthy lungs, what about flu? How does pr flu promote this process? Um, an aspect of this project um, that I didn't mention yet was we found that many uh, bacterial strains form microaggregates. All of the bacterial strains we tested form microaggregates in alveolar niches, but not all of those microaggregates were equally stable. Um, so let me explain what I mean by that. Um, this is an image of staph in live alveoli. You can see the microaggregates there in alveolar niches. Here I've digitally removed the red fluorescence of the alveolar epithelium in order to better show you the green fluorescence of the staph. Uh, but I have uh, put in a couple of uh, outlines here of, alve of alveoli to give you a sense of size. So we tried, uh, in, in order to test the stability of uh, the bacteria within these microaggregates, we tried to wash them out. So we used our micropuncture method to micropuncture an alveolus and rapidly and vigorously infuse the alveolar airspaces with buffer. So it was literally like a power wash. And you can see in this follow-up image that this, that their power wash had no effect on the USA 300 staff microaggregates. All of the microaggregates are located in the same place. Um, now we tried a different staff strain called Newman. Newman is a laboratory staff strain that's not known to be associated with human disease. And although Newman microaggregates formed, uh, or although Newman formed microaggregates, they were easily washed out by our washout procedure. And I think you can appreciate the difference between the two strains in the group data. So we initially thought, well, this must be a phenomenon specific to USA 300. And that made a lot of sense because USA 300 is a cl clinically virulent lung pathogen. It made sense that this particular bacteria was very good at stabilizing in the lung. But it turned out it was more complicated than that. So kind of by accident, as so often happens in science, um, we uh, used a different growth phase of bacteria. We went to the USA 300, but instead of instilling them in exponential phase growth phase as we had before, we used stationary growth phase. They, uh, the stationary growth phase formed microaggregates, but they were easily washed out, I think, again, as demonstrated by the group data. So uh, we took interest in the stationary phase issue because you know, uh, it's not known uh, what growth phase bacteria are in when they're inhaled from the nasal epithelium into the lung, but it's thought that their growth phase is more similar to the stationary phase in, that we use in the lab than it is to the exponential phase. So the behavior of the stationary phase staff is probably a better representation of what happens in reality. Um, but this raises a bit of a puzzle here because if stationary phase staff are more apt to dislodge from the nasal epithelium and be inhaled, but they're not very good at stabilizing in lung alveoli, then how do they initiate lung infection? And this is where we think flu comes in. So we think that flu might promote a secondary bacterial infection by uh, bacteria like stationary phase staph that are not primed to stabilize in lung alveoli. Uh, 
And we think the relationship between flu and staph might relate to liquid secretion in the alveolus. So um, a number of years ago, about 55 or so years ago, 60 years ago, uh, Charles Macklin proposed that a liquid layer lines the surface of, the, of lung alveoli. And this had not been considered before. The lungs were thought to be generally dry the way that skin is. And a number of people took interest in this issue, but it was very difficult to show morphologically um, until 1995, when Clements and Bastaki showed it by a series of uh, uh, really beautiful EM images, one of which I've shown here. So uh, to orient you, this is the alveolar epithelium, the basement membrane, and the interstitium. So um, what the EM images show here is that there is an alveolar surface layer, liquid layer lining the alveolar surface, and it's thin and continuous. Um, that uh, liquid lining layer is made up of an aqueous or water-based subphase that underlies a surfactant film at the air-liquid interface. Now, in 2007, so 12 years later, uh, the Bhattacharya lab where I trained showed that this aqueous subphase is generated by the continuous secretion of liquid by the alveolar epithelium. And this secretion uh, is dependent on function of the CFTR chloride channel. CFTR might sound familiar to you from the disease cystic fibrosis, and that will be a theme that keeps coming up in, in, over the next uh, couple slides. So why am I telling you this? The uh, alveolar surface lining layer is critical to normal alveolar function because it provides a medium for surfactant function, so therefore is uh, very important for alveoli remaining air-filled and not collapsing. But it doesn't just have that function. It turns out it's also important in alveolar defense. So the Bhattacharya lab showed that secretion of alveolar liquid into the airspace generates a flow of liquid along the alveolar surface no, um, that convectively transports or carries okay. inhaled particles out of alveoli and into the small airways. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier that liquid secretion uh, is CFTR dependent. Um, and it turns out that flu blocks soon. CFTR function uh, in vitro. Next week. So we consider the possibility that flu might disrupt alveolar defense against inhaled can bacteria by blocking in alveolar liquid secretion. Half hour? Now we can test okay. uh, or visualize alveolar okay. liquid secretion in live alveoli using a fluorescent alveolar liquid tracer okay. that Good we install directly into alveolar yep. airspaces. Okay. In this assay, time-dependent loss of tracer fluorescence indicates dilution of the tracer by liquid secretion. And to say it another way, or to summarize, tracer fluorescence loss indicates dilution by liquid secretion. And we confirmed uh, in vitro that if we dilute the stock tracer, we decrease the fluorescence. If we concentrate the stock tracer, we increase tracer fluorescence. So um, now let me show you what we found using the assay. Um, so this is a confocal image of live alveoli in a healthy lung that was pretreated with intranasal installation of buffer. Here, the alveolar epithelium is shown in pink, and the air spaces, which are normally black, are uh, filled by alveolar, our yellow alveolar liquid tracer. This is the same image, but here I've digitally removed the pink fluorescence of the alveolar epithelium to better show you the yellow fluorescence of the tracer. And you can see in this movie that over time, there was a loss of tracer fluorescence. And we interpret from the loss of tracer fluorescence that alveolar liquid secretion was present. This, this is a confocal image of live alveoli in a flu-infected lung. The pink fluorescence of the alveolar epithelium indicates that the alveolar epithelium was viable. And as different from the alveoli of the healthy lung, here we see that tracer fluorescence was retained and in fact increases a little bit. We interpret the retention of tracer fluorescence to indicate alveolar liquid secretion was absent and we conclude that flu blocked alveolar liquid secretion. So what's the mechanism and is it dependent on CFTR as I had proposed earlier? We uh, investigated the mechanism by carrying out this tracer experiment uh, in, a, in a series of experiments in which we modulated function of the alveolar epithelium. So this is a bar diagram. Uh, I'm gonna show you a series of experiments and downward bars indicates tracer fluorescence loss as you've already seen. Here we also pretreated mice uh, by intranasal installation of either buffer or flu. And then we pretreated the, uh, the alveoli with installation of drugs that activate or inhibit function of the CFTR ion channel or the epithelial sodium channel. So uh, these are data you've already seen, which was that in healthy lungs, we saw loss of tracer fluorescence indicating that uh, alveolar liquid secretion was present. And in line with what others have shown, we could block, liquid uh, we could block the tracer fluorescence loss by pretreating the alveoli with the CFTR inhibitor, indicating again as what's already known, which is that uh, alveolar liquid secretion is CFTR dependent. 
These are also data you've already seen, which was that tracer fluorescence increased in flu uh, infected lungs. And we considered, you know, since the epithelial sodium channel or ENAC is very important in absorption of liquid in the uh, perinatal lung, we thought it might mediate absorption of liquid in the flu infected lung. And so we blocked it uh, by pretreating the alveoli with the ENAC inhibitor amylaride. And under these circumstances, we could block the absorption of liquid in the flu infected lung. So this tells us that flu acts, uh, increases or activates ENAC function to induce absorption of liquid from lung alveolar air spaces. But what about the loss of liquid secretion? So we targeted CFTR by uh, the CFTR activator forskolin or the CFTR potentiator ivacaftor. And under both conditions, we could restore alveolar wall liquid secretion, telling us that flu also blocks CFTR function to block secretion of liquid into alveolar air spaces. And so we propose that flu has a dual effect on the alveolar epithelium in which it both turns ENAC on and CFTR off to change a normally secretory alveolar epithelial surface to an, a surface that's now absorptive. And we think that this has major implications for, the, uh, for alveolar defense and the outcome of bacterial infection, as you'll see later in the talk. Now, I wanted to point out also that this um, phenotype of ENAC on CFTR off has been described in the context of cystic fibrosis in the cystic fibrosis airway. It's thought that ENAC on CFTR off leads to uh, dehydration of the airway epithelial surface, promoting uh, the increased viscosity of secretions in the airway and secondary infections by bacteria. So we think that actually flu might cause a CF-like phenotype in lung alveoli. And again, we think that that may have implications for bacterial infection and lung defense. I also wanna point out here that, this, uh, that our use of the drug Ivacaftor um, raises the possibility that CFDR potentiator therapy might rescue alveolar liquid secretion in flu-infected lungs and therefore may be used um, from, a, for a, from a therapeutic perspective, as again, we'll address a little later in the talk. Okay, so um, before we move on, I just wanted to talk a little bit about ion channels because I think it's hard to understand ion channels in the abstract in a bar diagram. So I just wanted to spend a moment to show you what, uh, you know, what we think is happening. Um, so this is a cartoon of the alveolar epithelium. This is an alveolar epithelial cell. Here's the luminal or airspace side. Here's the basal lateral side. So under baseline conditions, constitutive activity of the sodium potassium ATPase pump drives sodium out of the cell and into the interstitium. At the same time, function of the sodium potassium 2 chloride channel brings uh, sodium back in and also brings with it chloride. This generates an electrochemical gradient that drives chloride secretion out through the CFTR channel into the airspace lumen. Sodium follows to maintain electrochemical neutrality and then water follows the osmotic gradient. And the outcome is secretion of liquid across the alveolar epithelial surface into the alveolar airspace, generating that liquid layer that we've been talking so much about. Um, under flu conditions, we think that flu blocks CFTR function. I don't have time to go into the mechanism today, but we think that flu actually causes dephosphorylation of CFTR and also activates uh, the ENAC channel, inducing absorption of sodium. So we think the ultimate outcome is absorption of fluid from the airspace across the alveolar epithelial surface and into the interstitium. Okay, so what are the consequences of this? Uh, you know, we've talked about how we're changing a normally secretory epithelium into an absorptive one, abrogating uh, an important lung defense mechanism. So we think that this may be a mechanism by which flu promotes secondary staph infection. And we started to get at that possibility in a three-step experiment. So we, uh, on the first day, we intranasally instilled mice with buffer or flu. One day later, we gave an intranasal installation of staph. And then one hour later, we took out the lungs and imaged them and did nothing else. We just viewed them to see what happened to staph fluorescence in lung alveoli. So this is an image of staph in alveoli of the buffer pretreated lung. Here again, I've digitally removed the fluorescence of the alveolar epithelium to better show you the blue fluorescence of the staph. But I've left a couple of alveolar outlines there to give you a sense of size and also help you understand that the, uh, that the location of the microaggregates were in niches as expected. So uh, within two hours, we saw there was major loss of staph fluorescence from alveoli of flu-infected lungs, and uh, microaggregates completely disappeared uh, from many locations. And so these findings indicate that the healthy lung cleared staph from alveoli. Now, in the flu-infected lung, we found that uh, inhaled staph do form microaggregates in alveolar niches, but as different from the healthy lung, the fluorescence of staph was retained over two hours. And I think you can appreciate the difference between the two conditions uh, here in the group data. 
So we interpret that flu infection caused alveolar retention of staph. And one possibility is, you know, I told you at the very beginning that flu disrupts uh, neutrophil function. And so you could think, well, maybe the reason that staph were retained in alveoli of flu-infected lungs is because neutrophil function was disrupted. But we didn't find that there were neutrophils in alveolar air spaces during the time course of our experiments. And we also didn't find that bacterial counts in the lung were different between these two conditions. So we don't think that bacteria were retained in the alveolar airspace because of a problem with bacterial killing. We think they were retained because they weren't cleared out by the normal secretion of alveolar wall liquid. So let's try to get at that a little bit more carefully. So here we, um, we set the flu uh, infected lung aside for a moment and just worked with CFTR inhibition. So we pretreated alveoli uh, with calcine, which you can see here in the pink. And we instilled the alveoli, we pretreated either with buffer or with a CFTR inhibitor. And then we instilled the alveoli with staph, wild type USA 300. So in this high power image of a, of a single septa, uh, septum associated with microaggregate, I think you can see that um, you know, the microaggregates are of similar size. They were of similar frequency across alveoli. And so therefore we interpreted that CFTR inhibition did not affect the formation of microaggregates in alveolar niches. So what about the stability? So uh, we tried, we went back to this power wash procedure where we tried to dislodge the microaggregates by um, alveolar installation of buffer. And as expected in the buffer pretreated lung using stationary phase staff, we could entirely wash out the microaggregates from, uh, from the buffer pretreated alveoli. However, we had no effect on microaggregates of, uh, of, of stationary phase staph in alveoli that were pretreated with the CFTR inhibitor. So whereas these stationary phase staph were normally susceptible to washout, now after spending one hour in a CFTR inhibited alveolus, they became sticky, they stuck to each other, they were impossible to dislodge. And uh, here's the group data that show the same thing that under normal, uh, under healthy conditions, we washed out the stationary phase staff again as expected, but CFTR inhibition completely blocked that. So um, I'd, I'd be happy to go into the mechanism, you know, at the end of the talk, I've left a little bit of time for discussion at the end. So I'm not gonna spend much time going into this, but what we think is happening is that, you know, as we've talked about many times now, this secretion of liquid into the alveolar airspace is CFTR dependent. So we think that the bacteria are still able to form clusters in alveolar niches, but now that that bacterial bacterial interaction that's so important to the bacterial sticking in the lung is blocked, perhaps in a mechanism that's uh, in a way that's related to CFTR. And so we think then that loss of epithelial CFTR function causes retention of staph in alveoli, and that perhaps as a corollary, the loss of CFTR dependent liquid secretion is responsible for staph stabilization in alveoli and the retention of staph in flu infected lungs. Okay, so I mentioned a little earlier in the talk that Ivacaftor rescued CFTR dependent alveolar liquid secretion in flu infected lungs. So we considered the possibility that Ivacaftor might therefore prevent staph stabilization in alveoli, um, paving the way for a potential you know, therapeutic use of Ivacaftor in flu infection. Um, so to determine whether this was the case, we did a series of two experiments. Thinking about use of Ivacaftor in people, we're not going to be giving it directly into lung alveoli as we had done in our earlier experiments. We'd be giving it systemically. So we tried that with mice. We gave Ivacaftor as an intraperitoneal injection. And we found that intraperitoneal injection of Ivacaftor indeed rescued alveolar liquid secretion in flu infected mice. And it also blocked the stabilization of staph in lung alveoli. Um, so therefore, the use of Ivacaftor was uh, functioned as we hoped it would um, in a two-point mechanism. Number one, it restored alveolar liquid secretion in flu-infected lungs. And number two, it blocked that stabilization of the bacteria after intranasal installation. So taking that into, into account, could Ivacaftor represent a new therapeutic approach for preventing fatal flu staph co-infection? We tested that possibility in a mouse model. So we, uh, on the first day, we intranasally instilled either flu or buffer. And on the second day, we intranasally instilled either staph or buffer. Some mice were treated with an intraperitoneal injection of Ivacaftor or vehicle. Now in mice that were treated uh, or infected with flu or staph alone, we saw 100% survival. So the pathogens uh, on their own did not cause mortality in mice but the combination of the two caused high mortality. So we saw mortality of uh, upwards of 60% in mice that were 
uh, treated with the combination of flu and staph. And these Hi. findings are in line with what's been, what's been published. Hello. Um, I didn't show both lines here, but we found the same mortality curve, whether the mice Morning. were treated with a vehicle or not. So, um, but to our um, I looked, I don't uh, have happiness, a we found that Ivacaftor reversed the situation that in mice co-infected with flu and staph, we saw that, uh, that there was 100% survival. So I think this is a good start, but it's important for us to do the follow-up experiments, experiments to understand whether the benefit of Ivacaftor is through a, a prevention of acute lung injury, as we had proposed based on our imaging experiments. Well, so our hypothesis was Ivacaftor's increasing survival well, by negative. protecting flu-infected mice from staph-induced alveolar damage. Yes. Yes. Um, so we uh, approached that in a, num a number of different ways. We tried to be okay. comprehensive about this, and we tested pulmonary edema or lung injury uh, using three different methods, uh, lung wet weight, extravascular lung water, or BAL total protein. And under all three conditions, Ivacaftor uh, protected against staph-induced lung injury. Um, so I think taking these experiments together, we now have three methods um, at three different know, time points, look that up, 24 hours after staff, six hours and 48 hours after staff to show that Ivacaftor protected against okay. staph induced lung injury. All right, we'll do it. Now, could Ivacaftor have exerted right. its survival benefit by an alternative pathway? Uh, one possibility is that it could have affected dissemination of staph from the lung to other organs. But when we looked at staph dissemination in the bloodstream to the spleen and to the liver, we found that there was no difference in staph dissemination between vehicle and Ivacaftor treated groups, um, either at six hours or at 48 hours. So that told us that Ivacaftor's survival benefit was not by prevention of bacterial dissemination. What about inflammation? We also found there was no difference in lung inflammation between groups. What about pathogen burden? We also found there was no difference between flu or staph pathogen burden uh, in the lungs at multiple time points. Finally, could Ivacaftor, you know, we're proposing that Ivacaftor is uh, functioning to rescue well liquid secretion after flu infection and therefore the co-infection aspect is critical. So, you know, could we show that, is, the, is there a benefit just on flu infection alone or staph infection alone, which might kind of undermine our hypothesis. In fact, we found that was not the case. In mice treated with flu alone, there was no difference in lung inflammation or lung injury. And in mice treated with staph alone, there was no difference in lung, in lung inflammation or lung injury. So I think taking all this together, we feel uh, fairly confident to interpret that in flu infected mice, Ivacaftor increased survival after staph installation by rescuing alveolar liquid secretion, thereby protecting against staph induced lung injury. So um, I'm gonna summarize our findings in this cartoon. Uh, what we've shown here is that in uh, alveolar epithelial CFTR function in health drives chloride secretion leading to liquid secretion uh, into the airspace, generating that uh, alveolar liquid layer on the alveolar surface. And in the presence of this liquid layer, now inhaled bacteria are cleared from, uh, from alveoli and are unable to initiate lung infection. However, in flu infection, we think that CFTR is dephosphorylated in the alveolar epithelium and ENAC is turned on, leading to an uptake of sodium and an uptake of liquid across the alveolar wall. Now in this absorptive microenvironment, staph that are inhaled from the nose are retained in alveoli and are able to initiate alveolar infection, cause alveolar damage and fatal lung injury. And we think that CFTR targeted rescue of alveolar liquid secretion using a drug like Ivacaftor protects against fatal lung injury and flu staph co-infection. And so I, I think, uh, you know, when I think about what's the, what's the novelty of these findings, like why does this matter? Um, I, I think in, in this project, I think about it in three ways. Um, the first one is it tells us a little bit about how the lung functions in health. So, you know, there's good data now uh, from the sleep literature and elsewhere that we aspirate oral pharyngeal secretions all night, every night. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, the lung is exposed to bacteria in those oral pharyngeal secretions all the time. And yet it's rare that healthy people develop a bacterial pneumonia. And so I think that the reason for that is because the lung's defense mechanisms are very good at eliminating bacteria from alveolar airspaces. And I think the secretion of liquid into the airspace is part of that defense mechanism. Uh, and now it, I think it explains a little bit why in the context of flu infection, secondary bacterial infections are so common. Um, the second point I think the findings show is it tells us a little bit about lung injury mechanisms. So 
lung injury is typically attributed to gain of liquid in the alveolar airspace by pulmonary edema fluid. I think what we're showing here is that also loss of liquid from the alveolar airspace is important in the pathophysiology of infection-induced lung injury. Um, and finally, I, I hope, I like to think, you know, as a pulmonary consult attending, that maybe there's some therapeutic implication here. Um, the way we're kind of thinking about it is perhaps uh, you know, in, in the future, maybe somebody comes in with uh, pneumonia, is hospitalized with pneumonia, gets their five days of Ivacaftor and per, or five days of Tamiflu, and may also at the same time, uh, you know, receive Ivacaftor that could potentially protect against the secondary lung infection. Um, and I'm not sure that these findings, you know, I, I guess we're, one thing we're considering in the future is, is this mechanism of CFTR inhibition specific to flu, or might it also operate in the context of other viral lung infections? You know, I think there's a possibility that that, that could be the case. So with that, I would like, oh, and I should also mention we were very uh, excited that this work was recently accepted um, for publication in the Journal of Clinical Investigation. So that is really, uh, we're, we're pretty pumped about that, and hopefully you'll see it um, in print soon. So I would like to thank everyone. There's so many people who've helped with this project. Um, in particular, Stephanie Deebly and Cassandra um, spearheaded the uh, in vivo mouse models and the live lung imaging. And these are not easy experiments. Um, everybody in the lab participated in this. It was a many year effort, really a labor of love, I think, on, on the part of everyone. And I'm very grateful for everyone's um, very important contributions. Um, I'd also like to thank our uh, funding uh, um, mechanisms and uh, and also CAF. You know, I, I came here, um, I think, four or five years ago now, 2019, um, and I've had just a just a fantastic time. Um, it's really been nice to set up uh, a lab in in such a good environment, um, and uh, and you know, I'm looking forward to working with everybody uh, in in the future. So thanks again for having me, and um, I'll open it up for questions and comments. Great job, thank, thank you. Thank you. Very proud to have you in the division. So we're opening the floor for questions. I'll ask the first one if that's okay. It's okay with me, so. <laughs> can you describe a little bit about the timing of what you're doing? So you showed you can inhibit CFTR um, and then potentiate it in the context of flu, but I wasn't sure whether you're acting on the CFTR receptor before you introduce the staff or before the flu infection happens. And I wanted to get your thoughts on whether the strategy you show is more of prevention rather than treatment, but what you're suggesting in clinical application sounds more like treatment than prevention. So can you clarify that? Yep. Maybe I misunderstood. Yep, yep. No, that's a very good question. So I think there are two, two parts of timing that's important here. The first one, just to clarify how the treatment was given. We gave it in between. So after flu infection and before staph infection. So we thought that, you know, when we think about um, how does, and, and this speaks to the second timing issue, you know, I, I think when we look at the literature, it's um, tempting to think that bacterial infection is an event that happens a week or so after flu. You know, there's like a, there's a great JAMA case report that, um, you know, series of case reports that, that it's, uh, it's in the sort of you know, flu get the, people get the flu, they start to get better, and that's when the secondary bacterial infection happens. But the truth is we don't actually know when it happens. And the bacteria may be inhaled at any time point after flu infection. And it's probably not all one event, you know, as we have demonstrated in mice. It's probably a process that proceeds over days. Um, and so we think that from a therapeutic perspective, there may be an opportunity if we, uh, you know, if we can target um, the restoration of alveolar liquid early on in flu infection, whether that happens right away or a couple days later, um, it could potentially be effective. And I think the possibility of having a time frame that's a little wider makes it more easily applicable to people. But the other, uh, the last thing I wanted to say about timing is, you know, I think in the literature there's very little known about the early physiological consequences of a viral infection. So, you know, when, when our paper was getting reviewed, one of the reviewers asked a very astute question, like how, you know, you're showing 24 hours after flu, is that really relevant? Um, and, and I think, you know, the community, there, there's not literature to think that it is relevant, but in fact, we're finding that within 24 hours, we're, the, the alveolus is already responding to flu infection. Um, and so I, I think the contribution, uh, uh, one of the contributions of this study is to help 
understand what are the very early effects of lung infection, even if we don't think about it, uh, you know, clinically. Thanks, Jim. Ben. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if, if the flu, uh, impact of flu is triggered by type 1 interferons, and if you if you think there are specific flu programs, that it's like you, you mentioned that this is not necessarily directly enhancing flu infection, but if you increase the, the dose Right, right. Okay, so uh, two, just to repeat for the people on Zoom. So the question related to uh, are interferons part of the mechanism? And then could there be some relationship between, um, you know, the, uh, like, like could, could wall liquid secretion or, or restoration of CFTR function have some impact on spread of flu uh, to other parts of the lung? So, um, you know, this is this. Uh, I think the upstream mechanisms here uh, will hopefully keep us in business for a little while. Um, the Stephanie's follow-up project. She's a, a PhD student in, in my lab, and her follow-up project is to understand what is the mechanism. And we're targeting this um, uh, idea that CFTR is dephosphorylated by flu, but that can happen by so many different pathways, and some of those pathways are even metabolic. Some of those pathways could respond to something like uh, like interferons. And you know, when we, um, one, one finding we thought was kind of interesting is when, um, when we looked at pathology, pathological studies like necropsy studies of flu infection, there's not a lot of flu virus in the distal lung. And yet we see that the inhibition of liquid secretion is, is across alveoli. Um, and we haven't been able to image flu virions itself, they're too small, but we think that the physiological effects of flu lung infection extend beyond individually infected cells. And there's a great paper, um, Anna fernandez Sesma here from Monsanto has, has a paper related to this, um, and there was one other group has, it was published on this as well, to show that there are responses, particularly related to interferons, in cells that are not directly infected. So the alveolar epithelium, you know, we think of it as individual cells, but it really functions more like a syncytium, more like the heart. And so these, uh, the alveolar epithelium is connected through these gap junctional channels. And so we think that a localized infection can actually have widespread effects. And, and that may be one way that these interferon responses may play a role as well. Um, as to the you know, confinement or spread of uh, viral infection, I'm not sure. You know, we did find that in our, at least in our Ivacaftor studies very early on, we did not see that, um, that Ivacaftor had an effect on the replication of flu, but we didn't look a little bit later. You know, the farthest we went out with our liquid secretion studies and things was about three days. Um, we did a little bit more than the 24 hours I showed, but you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. We've done, some, we've done some preliminary work in our lab about whether Ivacaftor might have an effect on flu infection alone at later time points. Um, and you know, maybe I'll be back for another grand rounds for that later. <laughs> we'll see. So you showed beautiful cartoons and you're, we're talking about infection, and yet I didn't see one macrophage, I didn't see one <laughs> neutrophil, I didn't see one lymphocyte, and it's all epithelial system. So can you speculate a bit about what role, of any, yes. do you think the immune yes, system yes, may yes. have in, in these infections? And yeah, stuff? yeah, I, I think that that's important, and um, um, you're actually not the first person to mention that. Uh, we did, I, I think in our lung imaging studies, it's always a little bit of a push-pull about how complex to let the experiments get. And so for practical reasons, we try to focus uh, specifically on alveolar epithelial function because I think that's something that we can look at. The type one alveolar epithelial cells are really unusual in that they're spatially very extensive and they also extend from one alveolus through the alveolar wall to cover alveolar walls of neighboring alveoli. So they're, they're, they're very complicated cells structurally um, and difficult to study in vitro. And so I think that the um, un, the, the, you know, the new understanding that we can generate related to alveolar epithelial function is, is kind of where we try to put a lot of our efforts. But that being said, I think that, uh, that the immune system absolutely plays an important role here. Um, and alveolar macrophages in particular, because these are cells that are 
that are often resident, you know, there are a number of populations of macrophages that are resident in the lung and so will be present at the time of onset of flu infection. Uh, and and I, I think that's something we'd like to look into a little bit later. And it may turn out that perhaps immune cells may be part of, you know, the generation of interferons or other immune responses that might potentiate, you know, the spread of uh, flu-induced lung injury across the epithelium. Um, but we are, we are starting to get into neutrophils, but it is complex. Yeah, John. Yeah. So the original studies about um, the uh, about this well liquid secretion and its role in lung defense were done with particles. So um, we th this was done in Jahar's lab before I joined. Uh, they instilled um, particles that I think were about somewhere between 0.5 and 1 micron and found that the particles were transported from away from the pleural surface and toward the small airways. So I think this defense function of the alveolar liquid secretion is not just specific to uh, the uh, to bacteria, but may also relate to how the lung clears itself of particles as well. Naomi. Right, right. Okay, so as to the, so the, the two parts of the question were, um, you know, what about kind of the nasal epithelium? Uh, and should we be, uh, should we seeking, should we seek better understanding of what's happening in the nasal epithelium and its role in, you know, inducing infections? Um, and then the second one, remind me, Naomi, just give me one word, I forgot. Oh, yeah, yeah, personalization. Yes, yes, yes. So um, as far as the bacteria um, on the nasal epithelium, I think some of the So I think the nasal epithelium has been studied, and you know, this is a little bit out of my area, so I hope I don't say anything uh, that's, that's not right. But my impression of, of that literature is that it's been studied, at least relevant to this project, in two contexts. One of them is... Uh, the um, sinusitis, chronic sinusitis that occurs in patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, and then the second one is things like, you know, whether um, MRSA decontamination procedures might reduce the instance, uh, incidence of pneumonias. And I think some of the VAP literature, my understanding is that some of these staph decontamination procedures may be helpful, um, but, you know, there's some limitations as to how, how translatable uh, and useful they are in clinical practice. Um, but, you know, I, I think that this, uh, the nasal epithelium is, nice because it's a more accessible, it's a respiratory epithelium, it's continuous uh, with the lung, and it's certainly more accessible. So it's been used uh, to great effect in cystic fibrosis to understand things like ion channel motility and how the disease develops and what happens to ion channels. Um, and I think there's a, there's a, I think there's a good chance that those kinds of studies could be informative here. There are some people doing some really heroic studies that I saw of like, um, you know, uh, like isolated mouse nares essentially or, or nasal structures to, to see what are the, what phase are the bacteria in and under what conditions. And it does look like from that literature that if you increase the temperature, like for example, if you have a fever, um, the bacteria will change their growth phase and perhaps become more easily dislodgeable. So I think there's more to be learned there. Um, and then as far as the personalization, so staph is not uh, the only bacteria to cause secondary lung infections. It's known for its virulence. Um, it causes a particularly high uh, mortality rate, but there are other bacteria as well, especially bacteria that are closely related, like streptomoniae. 
Um, the one comment I think I could make on this is um, I'm not sure about personalization exactly, like uh, you know how how you might be able to predict um, whether somebody might develop a secondary infection. We know that people at highest risk tend to be at the extremes of age, the very young, the very old. So those might be people you could target. Um, but then also I should mention that you know there's a group. Um, uh, my friend Wolfgang, who uh, trained in Jahar's lab before I came and is now in Munich, um, has a story just published a few months ago in Science Translational Med that shows that Ivacaftor by a similar but not directly related mechanism is helpful in mouse models of strep pneumonia lung infection. And so, you know, we it may turn out that we see Ivacaftor in clinical practice sooner than might be expected. We have a question from Zoom. We are a hybrid meeting. This is Dr. Kohler says, Terrific research, congratulations. Thank you. Can you comment on the potential impact of the thrombotic component seen in models of flu and bacteria? Ooh, that's a good question. You know, um, we, in, in our, uh, I, I talked earlier about the strengths of our uh, intact perfused lung model for understanding lung epithelial function. But another compartment that we have access to is the endothelium, the lung microvascular endothelium. And so we can understand the interplay between endothelium and epithelium and the interplay between microvascular lumen and airspace lumen. Um, so we, um, we have not looked at thrombotic, sort of thrombosis as, a, as, a, as part of the pathophysiology of viral infection. But I can say that we found that the flow of liquid of perfusate solution in the microvessel does have an effect on liquid secretion. So for example, if we block, if we, if we turn off flow in our intact perfused lung, we can actually induce liquid absorption. We haven't gone into the mechanism by which that might be happening, but it could reflect the possibility that if you have, you know, microvascular thrombosis and you interrupt microvascular blood flow, there may be a consequence on you know, uh, liquid secretion and defense in neighboring alveoli. Okay, great. I think we'll close the question and answer session at this time. I want to again thank you and congratulate you on a wonderful presentation. Thank, thank you very so much. much.